All right. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm going to be presenting my research titled Challenging Dominant Discourse, Pride and Settler Colonialism. I want to start my research with um, this painting by an artist named John Gass from 1872. Um, this painting illustrates a concept called Manifest Destiny. Um, and what this idea was, was really after the American Revolutionary War. Um, the idea of American leaders was to forge west across the continent um, by waging war to get new territory by purchasing it um, and developing it with white settlers. In the center of the painting, you can see the angel of progress as she's stringing telephone wire across the United States um, with the settlers behind her um, moving from east to west along with train tracks as a sign of developing. Um, the United States. And then on the left-hand side of the painting in the West, you can see the Native Americans fleeing the painting. And this is really indicative of um, placing the Native Americans on the reservation system with as little land as possible was the idea of the US government um, to populate the West. So what really got me interested in my research um, for settler colonialism was listening to the podcast Seeing White and Susan Harewood's first course, um, Be Close 500. And in one of these podcasts, we listened to um, an episode titled Little War on the Prairie. And what this episode discussed was um, how the US Dakota War of 1862 really changed in public memor memory to create a different narrative where the Native Americans had left the area peacefully in Minnesota. However, that really was not the case. Um, there was a war between Native Americans and settlers um, and they did not leave peacefully, they left forcefully. And the narrative was changed to help draw in settlers because no one wanted to move to Minnesota after hearing about this war. So 150 years later, nobody had remembered this war um, and that was how public memory had been changed. Um, so that's where it really got me interested to study my research question, um, which is how are the memories and nostalgia of settler colonialism created, reproduced and challenged through nar narratives and exhibit display at the National Nordic Museum, Burke Museum and the Hibbulb Cultural Center. The reason why I chose to focus on settler colonialism as um, through museum spaces was my interest in museums. I volunteered at museums for about 12 years now, and I've also done a couple of internships. And I chose the National Nordic Museum because there are a museum that um, focuses on immigration, um, particularly of a group of people from Europe from the Nordic region. And then I decided to choose the Hibbulb Cultural Center because they are an indigenous um, community trying to preserve their cultural history and autonomy. And I chose the Burke Museum because they are, um, they have roots as a colonial institution um, that's currently undergoing decolonization. And what I examine at all three of these um, museums is how they explore settler colonialism and what that looks like. Um, at the National Nordic Museum, I've chosen three labels to show you all, but um, in my capstone research project where I'm writing about it, I explore 10 museum labels, but to give you an, a broad overview of what I found here. On the left-hand side, the most pivotal thing about um, Euro-American immigration is um, the Homestead Act of 1862 or the Oregon, Oregon Land Donation Act of 1850. Um, there were free land incentives pe for people that were white essentially um, to get free land um, for developing it. They were, after a period of five years in the Homestead Act, um, they could get 160 acres of land for free if they showed the government that they had successfully developed and lived on the land. And at a time uh, between 1820 to 1920 um, from the Nordic region in particular, um, there was famine, there was a lot of poverty, there was a population boom, and there weren't these same kind of opportunities and their, um, their nation of origin. So a lot of people were immigrating from Europe 
um, and in this case, the Nordic region to America. Um, as you start out in the Nordic Museum, you start out on the top floor in what's considered the Nordic region and you get an understanding of why people decided to immigrate to America. Um, you And then you cross a bridge to what's called um, Nordic America and you follow the immigration story from the east, midwest to the west and then finally you stop at the Pacific Northwest, um, which is where the Nordic Museum is really founded in the Ballard area because there was a high concentration of Nordic people living in Ballard um, and, and they ended up building the National Nordic Museum to be what it is today. So there's a lot of history on the Pacific Northwest there. And that's what I'm focusing on in the other two pictures titled Logging and Fish Processor um, is the development of the Pacific Northwest um, from the Nordic community. So just to give you all a sense of the logging community and what it was, um, in the early 1900s, um, they had employed 10,000 Nordic people by 1900, and the Ballard region had 10 shingle mills, and they were producing 3 million shingle, shingles a day um, and sending that out worldwide. So Ballard was really known as Shingle Town USA at that point in time. And then this other picture is a fish processor. Um, it was invented in 1903 and it could process 110 fish a minute, and this replaced the work of 22 men. And what I'm getting out of uh, my analysis here is that the Nordic Museum is really promoting um, what America was looking for in this time period was Manifest Destiny, where they had successfully populated the West, put the Native Americans on a reservation system so that they could, um, develop economically with deforestation and like massive fishing industries. Um, there was also a lot of retail industries going in place because Seattle was a last pit stop for the gold rush up to Alaska. So people would stop to buy supplies here. Um, and then at the Hibbulb Cultural Center is kind of the opposite point of view of what settler colonialism looked like for Native American communities. Um, the Hibbulb Cultural Center is um, the Tulela people, which was comprised of the Snoqualmie, Skycomish, and the Snohomish people. Um, and this um, Tulela reservation came to be out of the Treaty of Point Elliot in 1855. And um, what the Treaty of Point Elliot was, it ceded millions of acres of land in King, Snohomish, and Skagit County to the US government to free up the land for settlers to come over um, and develop it. Um, out of the Treaty of Point Elliot, the Coast Salish people received $150,000 rights to fish, hunt, gather, receive food, and an education. Um, but the middle label here also explains why they just decided to um, give up these millions of acres was there was a lot of um, smallpox outbreaks that had really devastated their communities and there was settler encroachment and laws were enacted so that they couldn't fish, hunt, um, and gather food the way that they had before. So this treaty helped to protect those rights and there was also also threats of violence even though the Treaty of Point Elliot was peaceful. Um, unfortunately in the background of the text you can see the picture of the violence that was looming if they didn't sign. Um, and then on the right hand side, the assimilation process and they tried to make us farmers. Um, this is just one museum label of several throughout the Hibbulb Cultural Center of how um, assimilation was forced on the Native American communities. Um, and the, the intention was to put the Native Americans onto an allotment system to try and get them to farm like in a Euro-American type of way but it really was meant to just disband their community and create like a single families. And it didn't really work though because the forests were too dense and the um, farming equipment was too expensive. But this is just one example of many throughout the museum of different types of assimilation processes. Um, and then the Burke Museum, um, they are historically, they're a colonized institution. Um, they sit on the University of Washington, Seattle campus, and they've been there since 1899. Um, a lot of museums, uh, and as well as the Burke, 
um, would house and collect stolen Amer Native American artifacts. And today they really recognize that history and are trying to decolonize, meaning that they work with indigenous communities to display those items now, or they give them back to the items or to the community if they would like to have them repatriated. Um, so the, the violent legacies of colonialism is the first label on the first floor, the first gallery, right? As you walk in, you read this label. And then this middle label here, impacts of colonialism, is also another recognition of um, how Native Americans were forced onto the reservation system. And the top part of the label, you can see the map of Washington and it's all in orange. And the lighter orange colors are the uh, where the 29 federally recognized tribes live today. So you can see this huge land mass and how little it is um, for the Native American uh, reservations in comparison to the entire state of Washington was once theirs. On the bottom half, you can see um, it explains devastating and long lasting impacts of colonization. And it talks about how Native Americans, um, the US government imposed laws for them to not be able to get their traditional ways of food, um, which led to diabetes and heart disease. And then in a smaller text, you can't really see it, but it asks, what would you do if you weren't able to gather your food and your, your traditional methods, how would you get food? Um, and then the last one here is a uh, land acknowledgement that uh, the University of Washington and the Burke Museums um, on Coast Salish land since time and immemorial, excuse me. Um, so with that being said, um, the National Nordic Museum, um, their history is a little po problematic because they don't really reference Native American history it within their museum space and tell that counter narrative um, of what happened to the Native Americans in order for them to be able to settle in the Northwest and across the United States. Um, so this is an example of a Thanksgiving program here that is available on the Burke Museum's website um, that tells alternative um, views from Native American perspective, perspectives on the Burke Museum or on Thanksgiving, excuse me. Um, so the, the National Nordic Museum can incorporate something like this um, into educational programs or special events. And then this is um, art from an artist named Susan Ringstad Emery. She is of a mixed heritage of Nordic ancestry and Inupiat, which is Alaska Native American. Um, she has done an oral history project with the National Nordic Museum and that is available online. Um, and I reached out to her to ask her what she thinks the National Nordic Museum can do to help incorporate the narrative of um, Native American history into the National Nordic Museum. And she had suggested an art exhibit, not only with her art, but beyond that to other Coast Salish Native American artists. Um, I guess that the Nordic Museum has been working on doing something like this before COVID hit but it's just one idea of several for them to start incorporating that narrative within their space. Um, in addition, I do think that they could also add a land acknowledgement. I haven't seen a land acknowledgement within their space either, um, but those are just one of many possibilities for the National Nordic Museum to help incorporate that counter narrative. Thank you for listening.